In Prague, during the years leading up to World War I, an unusual and distinct style of architecture was created, developed by a small, radical group of young architects, motivated by desires to create architecture originated from the artistic imagination alone. Tragically short-lived, only a few examples exist of this idealistic and unique architecture. In 1907, the art collector Daniel Henry Kahnwiller, shortly after opening his first gallery in Paris, was introduced to Picasso, who along with George Braque, was developing a new style of painting. Unfortunately, this early meeting between the pair was less than amicable. Picasso was highly critical of Kahnwiller, viewing him as just some rich kid playing with his dad's money. Despite this initial animosity, Picasso's opinion of the young art collector changed over the following months, admittedly for somewhat selfish reasons, as Kahnwiller became an early proponent and patron of the artist's fledgling style. A style which at this point lacked a name. That would come a year later, when the art critic Louis Fussell, attending an exhibition of Braque, described his work as having reduced the landscapes, people and houses to the shapes of cubes, cubic oddities, and with that a name was coined, Cubism. Through art collectors and artists, Cubism spread quickly across the continent, exacerbating this rapid dissemination in their homeland. Influential members of the Czech art community returned to Prague from Paris to espouse Cubist ideas. By 1910, interest was great enough that the Manus Association of Artists hosted an exhibition of Cubist paintings in Prague. Among those to attend was art collector and historian Vincent Kramarsch, who, so enamoured with the bold and distinctive works, immediately travelled to Paris where he purchased a piece by Picasso from Kahnwiller. Over the years, Kramarsch's ever-growing collection of Cubist paintings along with his own writings on Cubism, became pivotal for influencing the artists in Prague. This included architect Pavel Janak, who, in 1911, gained access to Kramarsch's collection and was finally able to experience the Cubist paintings firsthand. Janak had been part of a group of young Czech architects, Josef Gochar, Josef Hochel, and Vlastislav Hoffmann, who had been taught or heavily influenced by Austrian architect Otto Wagner who unintentionally would become a catalyst for the developments made in Czech architecture in the pre-war years. Wagner, in the late 1800s, had joined the Vienna Secession. He was critical of his fellow architects' reliance on styles of the past, thinking they were betraying the modern world with their lack of confidence. This scepticism motivated him to adopt an architectural realism, devoid of the unnecessary features and flourishes of historicist architecture. It was intended to be true to the nature of its construction and materiality. These were principles he inherited from the Gothic Revival architect Augustus Pugin, who argued there should be no features about a building which are not necessary for convenience or construction, and secondly, that all ornament should consist of enrichment of the essential construction of the building. Unlike the historicist architecture, where form was prioritised over function, Wagner and his architectural functionalism prioritised function over form. He became Professor of Architecture at the Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna, where he taught both Janek and Hochel. His functionalism was first embraced by the Czech architects, who saw it as a cure for the societal disease they thought historicist architecture was. Unfortunately for Wagner, this attitude was short-lived. The young architects, beginning to rebel, saw Wagner's particular modernist architecture, while at one point necessary and forward-thinking, to be outdated. It lacked the potential for the creator to express their individualism or spirit. This reaction against Wagner's functionalism and the arrival of Cubist art from Paris aided the germination of Cubist architecture. Janek was inspired by what he saw in Kramner's collection of Cubist paintings, believing that the principles of Cubism could be implemented in architecture. He thought this could offer a solution to Wagner's functionalism. Janek had for a number of years been part of the Manus Association of Fine Artists, where he wrote a number of pieces for their journal style, raising ideas relating Cubism with architecture. Due to these writings, he was rapidly becoming one of the most respected and influential figures of his generation. Yannick was also becoming more disenfranchised with Manus, seeing them as outdated like Wagner, and further wanting to explore the Cubist principles, Yannick along with fellow architect Hoffman helped found the new group Scupina, and its publication Artistic Monthly. Yannick wanted to bridge the gap between the utilitarian modernism and the historical architecture, creating something that was harmonious with the older styles. Yannick believed a return to form over function was required, arguing that inert matter acquired form through imagination and creativity, thus replacing function as the basis for form. Hoffman in his writings discussed the relationship between matter and motion, believing that the whole mental life of man is governed by an inner motion. 
To master matter means to lend it man's own movement, meaning to put matter into motion. As buildings are inherently static, the architect's challenge was to represent motion through a static object. Yannick thought he had resolved this dilemma through the use of the crystal in the pyramid to convey this movement. The pyramid was the ultimate form of matter abstracted by mind. Differentiating themselves from the cubist painters, this focus of movement in the abstracted sense drew criticism. Carol Tiger saw the architects as naive. The concept that the use of space and matter in cubism could be applied to architecture was just an idealistic fantasy. He argued that they misunderstood the fundamentals of both architecture and cubism, that they did not adhere to the use of geometry as the painters had, and that their view of form over function was equally absurd. That architecture is, by its nature, determined by function and should be directed by rational functionalism. Austrian art historian Birnbaum criticised Yannick's supernatural theory in primitive naturalism and pure materialism by misguidedly equating the principles of human creation with the entirely mechanical laws of physics. The remodelling of Dr. Farrow's house in 1913 put Yannick's theories to the test, providing him with his first opportunity to implement his ideas about cubism into something tangible, while also offering the chance to display cubism in harmony with historical styles. His main task was to remodel the exterior of the building while retaining the overall Baroque nature. The cubist ideas had to be portrayed through the facade of the building with minimal alterations made to the wider structure or the interior. Yannick implemented the cubist principles via faceted planes, added to the upper gables and to the balcony's buttresses. 90 degree angles were avoided, instead relying on triangles and diagonal lines, forms inspired by crystalline structures. Probably the best known example of cubist architecture is the House of Black Madonna by Josef Gochar. Here, Hoffman and Yannick's ideas came closest to being fully realised. Like Yannick, he utilised the facade of the building to express the fundamentals of cubism through three-dimensional geometric forms. Unlike previous projects though, where interiors, to remain habitable, were kept in the realms of more conventional architecture, Gochar managed to express cubism both externally and internally. The angular facets of the facades are reflected in the interior of the building. The walls slant on diagonal planes, juxtaposed with the more conventionally orientated floors. Similarly, the designs of the exterior metalwork are carried out through the interior of the building, echo through the angled window grates, balconies and staircase railings. As Janek had written about and achieved at the Doctor's house, Gochar successfully integrated cubism with historical architecture. The Gothic main entrance of the building is surrounded by large classically inspired columns and cornice, two disparate styles skillfully implemented to work harmoniously. At the outbreak of the war, many of the artists and architects were conscripted to fight. Despite the core group of architects surviving, upon their return they found the group they formed disbanded. Little remained of the idealistic and optimistic community which existed before. The creation of the new Czech state birthed an attitude of pragmatism. The architects were expected to help their country recover from the war, not search for utopian ideals and true artistic expression. The architects sought a more democratic style over this period, abandoning many aspects of cubist architecture, with some even returning to the realism of Wagner's functionalism. Czech cubism was never fully realised as the issues with form, matter, motion that were raised by critics and the architects themselves were never resolved. Despite its critics and short lifespan, Czech cubism has since seen a resurgence in the minds of artists and designers alike, making an appearance in some surprising places, with Czech cubist inspired champagne glasses, plates and vases. Even Skoda claim an influence to the all but forgotten style, where sharp crystalline angles are incorporated into the body of their futuristic looking cars. Finally, Czech cubism in 2012 saw a return to architecture in EM2N's Keystone Building in Prague, directly mirroring the prominent features of the Cubist facade from a century before.